Supervised PhDs, a podcast series by Tara Brabazon and Steve Redhead. Hello, my name's Tara Brabazon. And I'm Steve Redhead. And welcome to our third podcast in our series, How to Supervise PhDs. And this third podcast is on the selection process, the entry into a PhD program in a university. And if you don't mind, Steve, I'll start with a story of what happened to one of my PhD students. A young man was being interviewed for entry into a doctoral program into a particular university. So before he arrived for his interview, the panel composed of three, uh, two gentlemen of a certain age and myself as the prospective supervisor, the panel got together and we we were working out the questions that we would ask this young man upon his arrival. And I suggested (laughs) The first question should really ask is, what motivated him to decide that now was the time to do a PhD? Because I believe motivation is incredibly important. If a student isn't motivated at the start, they're not going to finish. So the motivation always matters to me as a question. But the chair of the committee stated to me, we're not going to ask that question, Tara. Remember, I was a professor at this time. Uh, We're not going to ask that question, Tara. We're going to tell him why he's doing this degree. And interestingly, that chair of the committee, that uh, gentleman professor, did ask that question. The young man did still enter into the program, but the question we've always got to ask is really, should he have? So, Steve, what are the characteristics of what you see as a poor selection process? So for a student going into this process, what warning signs should they look for? I think one of the things, and I've seen this quite a bit, is the way in which a you know, panels and subdeans and so on actually look at students um, as if they're only going to be people who have done their undergraduate degree, usually honours degree, and a master's, and then gone into a PhD programme. Increasingly, what I find is that the... PhD candidates are of all sorts of different ages, Lovely. different stages of their lives. Brilliant. Increasingly, actually, people who um, who may be even over 60, for example. Now, that's a re- really good um, issue because at one time you would simply not have got those people into the academy. But a lot of the time, you know, just partly through the sort of social changes globally, which are affecting... Um, age and what people do with it, you're getting all sorts of different kinds of candidates. And if you just simply have a panel which looks at the model of a student uh, who has basically in their 20s, who's doing a PhD because that's what they are expected to do, particularly if they want to enter university teaching, um, then you're going to miss out on so many different kinds of candidates. And I've probably had that prejudice too because I've been in the academy a long time and probably did use that model at one time. But I'm noticing more and more and more that the really interesting PhD candidates are at all sorts of different stages and they are incredibly well motivated. So if you do interview them, and as sub-dean I'm tending to actually personally interview people more and more in this job, Um, I'm finding that you can tell the motivation from the interviews that you do, and and usually face-to-face interviews, but you can do Skype interviews as well. And I I think that's one of the things that's happened. You've got such a diversity of candidates now, all of whom are very, very good, but they don't fit that old model. And I think we have panels certainly have to start looking at things in different ways. Subdeans have to look at things in different ways. See, I think that's brilliant. So... If for, for candidates who are coming to the process and the war, the warning signs I think are important so if you're feeling any sort of ageism or mm-hmm. ages there's mm-hmm. no you don't have to put up with that because as Steve said some of the best PhD students you and I have had have been over 50 mm-hmm. indeed have been over 60 sometimes yeah. Yeah. and increasingly we're finding that in universities so yeah. don't be apologetic don't think oh should I be here you have every right to be there so watch for ageism I'd say also watch for sexism mm. so yeah. if there's some sort yeah, of you know women 
children, family yeah. thing going on, walk away from the vehicle. Yeah. Okay, so women do fantastic PhDs. They do them at speed. They do them with families. Do not be concerned. So do make sure that there's no sort of weird gender bias there. Obviously, in terms of you know sexuality as well, anything mm. like that, or indeed race, mm. make sure there's no bias there. And speaking particularly from our English experience, do watch guys and gals for any sort of bias uh, in terms of accent. So in the United mm. Kingdom, I often saw very implicit, sometimes explicit, biases against guys and gals who were not from England mm. and from particular other Euro regions, mm. shall I say. So you don't have to put up with that. So do watch, I think, mm. for xenophobia. And make sure that I think the panel or the people that are dealing with you are respectful at all times. I think your other great point is make sure that they understand the whole of you beyond just simply you've done an undergraduate degree, you've done a coursework master's. Make sure they've actually done their homework mm. and they're really thinking about the whole person. Mm. And, and particularly background in you know all sorts of aspects of life because those people are uh, bringing to the table a great deal of experience, really diverse experience, yeah. which will impact on the, the content of the PhD. So. In a, in a beneficial way. In a brilliant way. Yeah. yeah. So the second question which we've in some ways answered is what what is a great selection process? And I think probably it is some sort of interview or, or email correspondence or Skype, but it's a respect of the whole person, mm. I think. That's a great process, someone who really cares mm. about the whole person. What else would you recognise as this is a good and a functioning system um, for entry? A, a, pro- a proper... Uh, commitment to really finding that that potential student the appropriate supervisor, because that, in the end it's not going to be the panel that's going to do it, or the subject that's yeah. going to do it. It's actually the, the, we're back to the issue of how do you fit a supervisor and a student. So that panel has to be experienced enough and, and knowledgeable enough, really, of the institution to to find proper um, supervision for that student. Yeah. The, the other final warning for students, I would say, and I often say this to students, you've heard me say this in, in speeches for years, is that don't be flattered. You are a PhD student is incredibly valuable. Supervisors desperately want you. Mm-hmm. Universities desperately want you. You are, you are paying fees or you're on a scholarship and the government's paying the fees for you. You are a very, very valuable commodity. Any university would want you. So the key is don't be flattered. Think about what is the best for you, the mm-hmm. best situation for you. And if it's feeling wrong, it probably is wrong. So just be aware of your own personal value and do not allow senior staff, prospective supervisors to push you down into the shape that they want you to be. Or, mm, or the sort of topic that Indeed. they want, which is really, it's a very difficult thing as you're not, you, the PhD student isn't, at the beginning isn't knowledgeable enough. Um, although certainly when this issue of diversity comes up, age, sexuality or gender or race or whatever, um, quite often now I think you are getting particularly more mature PhD students. They do know a lot at the beginning. Yeah. They're still uh, naive sometimes about how the supervision is going to go, but actually they do know quite a lot more than supervisors in different areas, and that is really interesting. So that, uh, that again, the panel or subdeans or whatever have to look at that aspect um, really quite carefully, I think, and to get the right fit. Because you're not just talking about people who don't have uh, a pretty you know, confident aura. Yeah. These, many of the persons that we're getting now have a very confident aura. They may not have done a PhD before, but they know a lot about the aspects of the work. So. Yeah, so it is about, I think, recognising the individual student's yes, value very much so. and recognising that everybody wants you. Because I think a lot of the students in, in my life who I've seen who have been treated badly have come in being so grateful yeah. that the university yeah, has accepted it's a naivety, them yeah. and so grateful that this great you know, big-name supervisor has taken them on yeah. that actually it's hurt them. Yeah. And so always remember your value when you're going into the selection yeah. process and sit up tall in the chair and look them in the eye. Mm. And be, be confident about it. Yeah. Hope that was useful, guys. On to the next one. Thank you for listening to this podcast. 
titled How to Supervise PhDs. Please feel free to contact Steve or Tara at Charles Sturge University. We'd love to hear from you.